gentle reminder that all participants should keep their mics muted. The main chat box will also be disabled. If you face any technological issues, please message the user named tech support. And if you have any questions at any point in time of the webinar, please post them to the user named Q&A. Thank you for your patience as we wait for our final participants to join us this evening. Welcome to the fourth webinar in the Science Behind Animal Behaviour series, where we will be focusing on the behaviour modification of dog aggression. Now to introduce our speaker for today, it's our pleasure to welcome Mike Shikasho, who is a certified dog behaviour consultant, working exclusively with dog aggression cases through private consultations. He was the past president of the International Association of Animal Behaviour Consultants, or IAABC, He's fully certified through the IABC and is a member of the Association of Professional Dog Trainers, or APDT. Mike is sought after for his expert opinion by numerous media outlets, such as the New York Times, and is a featured speaker at many conferences, universities, and seminars around the world. He offers a variety of workshops, webinars, and online courses on the topic of canine aggression, including the Aggression in Dogs Master Course and also hosts the popular podcast show, The Bitey End of the Dog. We are hence very excited to have him as our speaker at our webinar today. Before we begin, a gentle reminder to mute your microphones and post any questions that you may have to the user named Q&A, and this can be done throughout the session. Thank you. Over to you, Mike. Excellent. Let me go to sharing my screen and uh, we'll get this going. All right. My uh, PowerPoint should be up there. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me for this little series, this webinar series. Uh, we're doing day one and day two for this, and we're going to be talking about understanding and modifying dog aggression uh, a little bit today. Uh, I'm going to go into about some of the what's called the prognosis, or so what we can expect for reasonable outcomes based on a number of factors in aggression cases. And I'm going to show you a case study uh, that'll happen tomorrow where I work an aggression case from start to finish. So you can kind of see the process of how I work these cases and how we can change aggression in dogs. Okay, so the big question is, what is aggression? Uh, I get that question a lot. And the interesting thing is it really depends who you ask. There's different definitions out there. There's different academic definitions, depending if you're talking about humans or dogs or dolphins, uh, it's gonna vary, but really it's behavior. Aggression is behavior. And we wanna, as you'll see, we wanna really avoid using that label uh, when we're trying to help the dogs because it doesn't help us understand what's going on. Uh, the motivation for the behavior and the antecedents or what's triggering the behavior. So uh, you'll see that it's much easier if we focus on what the dog is doing rather than what we think the dog's uh, going on in the dog's brain in terms of their uh, ideas to get that thing to go away. So the, the motivation for most aggressive behavior is to increase distance from a particular stimulus. Their goal is to make a threatening stimulus go away. And oftentimes it works because most people don't stick around if a dog is biting them. Uh, so uh, the behavior can be anything from growling, snarling, snapping, biting, lunging. Typical, typical behavior is used to increase distance from a stimulus. So you'll see that we're gonna be focusing on two uh, elements for aggression. And then one is what's happening in the environment. So the external factors in the, uh, that, that's triggering the dog's behavior. And then you have internal factors, sort of what's going on underneath the hood in aggression cases. So we have what's called motivating operations or motivations for behavior. 
Um, and one of the most common ones, of course, in aggression cases is fear. The dog is afraid of whatever is in the environment that's approaching. Um, sometimes it can be some other underlying motivational responses or emotions happening with the dogs. It can be anger. We often see pain-related uh, behavior in aggression cases. The dog has something that's bothering them. Um, so we might look at that. You can sometimes see frustration, arousal, stress. Uh, in some cases, it's fun for the dog. And we'll touch upon that a little bit in terms of what uh, breed-specific behaviors we might see in uh, particular breeds of dogs. Uh, but sometimes we purpose breed dogs for aggression. And you know, livestock guardian dogs might be a good example of that, or Bells and Malinois doing police work would be a good example of that. So they're having a good time using aggressive behavior. So it's a little different in, in regards to that type of motivation. All right, so I'll show you a little video here, just a fun video that shows, uh, you know, what aggression looks like from the human side of the coin. And you're going to see some um, silly behavior here from humans, but you're also going to see, you know, what, what we might reasonably expect a human to do if their resources are threatened uh, or they're worried about somebody taking away their resources. So let me play this and let's uh, just make sure the volume's okay. All right, let me play this video. Oh, damn, man. How is that? Why are you taking more burritos? What do you mean, dude? Pick up. <laughs> hey, man! Yo, Chick fil A. Yo, there's somebody eating in their car over there. See it crawl? Them? Oh no, there's someone right here, even closer, even closer, here. Oh, hell yeah. Hey, hey. What? Whoa. Give me my back. Why? It's not even yours, it's mine. It's mine. Give it back, dude. Well, I found it. No, you found it. I found it. Thank you. That one played a little bit chop, choppier than it usually would, but um, let me see if I can find it right here. So typical human response, right? Somebody steals your sandwich. Some stranger comes up and just grabs your sandwich, right? Eats it. And then what would your response be? To be pretty upset. So this woman throws her shoe at this guy running away. Now, if that happens in the human context, most of us would think, okay, that's normal. She's responding normally. But when we turn it around and we start looking at dog behavior, a lot of times I get um, the opposite response. You know, how dare my dog do that? I'm the one that feeds him. Um, you know, I give him all the good things. How dare my dog growl at me? So sometimes we misunderstand what's normal canine behavior, where they're using an aggressive response or an aggressive behavior to make something threatening go away. So here's a good video example of that. Let's hope this one plays a little better. So you can see aggressive responses in dogs, very normal behavior. We can reasonably expect that for any animal to respond in a way that's going to be protecting themselves or something they value or somebody they value. And again, so we want to look at the context and what's happening in the environment um, because we don't want to necessarily say, you know, this is an aggressive dog. It's aggressive behavior. Okay, so next up, I'm just, I have have some of these labels here. These are common labels you might see or hear about. You might read about them. Somebody might have talked to you about them. But the issue with labels, again, similar to saying a dog is aggressive, um, we've got to be careful with labeling certain types of behaviors because it doesn't tell us what the dog is doing. So let's say, for instance, the resource guarding dog gives me an idea of what's happening, you know, so the dog is protecting something it values, but it doesn't tell me what the dog is doing. 
And what's going to be much more helpful to me to help that dog is to say, okay, the dog growled when somebody reached for its bone from one foot away or a few centimeters away, or whatever the distance is. That's going to be much more helpful because it's going to tell me what the dog is doing, what context it's happening in, what environment it's happening in. And then once I understand, I know those things, I'm going to be able to modify the behavior much more effectively. So you'll see that it'll start to make more sense as I show you some of the cases as we go along. So I'm really careful about using these kind of t terms or labels. I'd rather much somebody say, you know, my, my dog chased, you know, a, a girl on a bike down the street and bit her on the leg. Um, and, that, and he left my property when he did that. That's going to give me much more information than, than labeling it something like predatory aggression. So when I'm going through history taking with a client, I'm asking them more so what did they see, not what did they think happened. And sometimes they say, oh, he's just stubborn or, you know, he's just being a jerk. You know, it gives, they, they give these dogs the labels that really aren't going to help me help the dog. So I'm, I'm often, much like I'm kind of determining what happened in a crime scene, uh, I'm doing a lot of detective work. I'm asking questions about what happened, what was the context, what were the people doing, what were the other dogs doing, if it was a dog-to-dog -dog aggression case, uh, and uh, determining underlying motivations as well. So there's a couple fancy terms here, if you're not familiar with these. There's something called distant antecedents or setting events. Those are things that are gonna make it more likely for a behavior to happen, uh, but by themselves, the behavior won't happen unless you have the antecedent. So the antecedent are the things that come before the behavior that set that behavior in motion. So the hand reaching towards the bone is the antecedent for the growling behavior. The consequence is the hand moving away, hopefully, uh, and that's what maintains that behavior. That's what says the dog's like, all right, growling worked because that hand moved away. So the hand reaching is the antecedent, the behavior is the growling, the consequence is the hand moving away. And you need both of those factors um, to really understand how we can help the dogs. All right, so here's a, here's a kind of easy way to think about it when you're looking at distant antecedents and antecedents. Again, those fancy, they're applied behavior analysis terms for uh, helping us understand the behavior. So think about like a fuel drum. So let's say you have a gas tank or a fuel drum, just like you see here on the screen, and you start to add in more fuel. The more fuel you have in there, the more likely you are to get an explosion, right? So if I'm dealing with a dog that's highly fueled, I'm much more likely to see an aggressive response. But just the fuel itself is not going to explode unless you have a match or a spark or a flame to set that explosion in motion, right? And those are what we call the antecedents. So let's go back to that video where we saw the dog kind of growling near the rawhide. Uh, if the dog's alone with just the rawhide, there's no need to growl because there's no match, there's no spark, there's no hand approaching, which is the antecedent. So if you start to look at aggression like that, you'll start to almost always see a trigger or an antecedent in the environment. There's almost always, always a trigger that we can identify that we'll understand, okay, that's why the dog responded aggressively. And then we start to unpack the distant antecedents, the fuel. So let's go back to that dog that was growling near the bone. If I've got a dog that's hungry, or maybe they're on a medication or steroids or something that's making, that's increasing their hunger, we're adding layers of fuel there. Let's say the dog also had a stressful day, you know, no, no rest at all. Lots of construction happening outside the home, dogs walking by the window, the dogs barking and having a tough time with all of those dogs. There's more fuel there because the dog's more stressed. It's just like people. If we have a tough day at work, we're going to be more likely to snap at our partner uh, if they ask us to do the laundry, right? So you're adding more fuel there. Um, so what our job will be to decrease that fuel and also deal with the matches, prevent that explosion from happening in the first place and replacing uh, the behaviors, which we'll talk about more in just a moment. So first thing in our behavior change plans is reducing that fuel. So I'll give you some other common, um, common distant antecedents for, for behavior. So to reduce the fuel, we have to do things like making sure the dog is not stressed throughout the day. So reducing the exposure to stressors, uh, addressing medical issues, underlying medical issues, very common in aggression cases. It's a very, very important to work in conjunction with a veterinary professional in a lot of the aggression cases, uh, because we wanna rule out underlying 
pain issues, discomfort. There's certain medications that can increase the likelihood for aggression. Uh, there's definitely medical conditions um, that can increase the likelihood for aggression. And if we don't address that, we're just dealing with a highly fueled dog all the time. So it's again, important to reduce that fuel. We also have to address things like enrichment and the dog's uh, uh, amount of enrichment they get, physical and mental stimulation. Because what happens in a lot of aggression cases is that's reduced significantly because of the management involved. So for instance, the dog, uh, let's say a dog barks and lunges at people out on walks on a leash, and maybe the dog has bitten some people out on walks. A lot of times we're going to manage that because we don't want that to happen anymore, or the owner's embarrassed or they physically can't handle the dog. So they stop going for walks. Maybe the dog only goes out in the backyard for the bathroom breaks. So you're reducing the amount of enrichment for that dog. So we, it's very important to replace that with something else. Uh, so that again, we're not dealing with a highly fueled situation um, and then look at everything else in the dog's uh, uh, life, daily life. It can be the most simple things like changes in the weather, um, different uh, changes in environment, moving the dog. All those things can add fuel. And our job to help these dogs is to really reduce those fuels as much as possible. Um, you, don't, you don't get rid of them all, unfortunately. You're often dealing with a little bit of fuel, uh, depending on the dog but uh, we wanna reduce that as much as possible to reduce the likelihood for an explosion. So you address that, those distant antecedents first. Then you work on the actual matches or the sparks, the antecedents. We start to determine, okay, it's that hand reaching towards the dog when it's eating, or it's the person coming through the front door of the home when the dog's uh, you know, in the living room, um, or it's the child riding by on a bike. Those we can start to identify as the antecedents. Now what we want to do is say to the dog, when we see those antecedents, when you see those matches, if you give me another behavior, that's going to pay off way better for you. So we start to do what's called differential reinforcement procedures. Again, another fancy term for just simply saying, what do you want the dog to do instead? So what do you want the dog to do instead of charging and lunging at somebody coming through the front door? We might say, go to a different spot, sit, stay, look at the person, anything else other than trying to bite that person. Uh, we can start to replace aggressive behaviors with desirable yeah. behaviors. So we can place with desirable replacement behaviors. There's, there's a few different ones that are, are, no, are part of the differential reinforcement. They might be alternative behaviors, other behaviors, or incompatible behaviors. They all work very similarly. Again, it's to replace the aggressive behavior with something desirable. And I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. I'm sure there's a lot of questions going through your mind about how do we do that. Um, and we're also going to try to make it as easy as possible. So that's the, the law of behavior. The behavior economy is that any animal, humans included, are going to choose the, the easiest path to reinforcement. So when I'm dealing with aggressive behavior, especially, I want to make it that replacement behavior as easy as possible for the dog so it doesn't require much effort. Um, but I'm also going to make it easy for the client. So I'm not going to have them do oftentimes really in-depth advanced training. You're going to see the process is very, very straightforward and uh, easy for both the dog and the client. And for any trainers or, or behavior nerds out there where sometimes I get the question, you know, is it operant or classical conditioning? And those are, again, just uh, applied behavior analysis categories for uh, voluntary behavior or involuntary behavior. So operant conditioning is like if I ask a dog to sit and the dog's butt hits the ground and I give them a cookie, that's operant conditioning. They're thinking about it. They know they're sitting. Uh, versus classical conditioning, if um, a spider falls on your head um, and you get the, the hair stand up on the back of your neck and you have like this real um, uh, you know, overt response and your heart, heart starts to beat faster. That's classical conditioning. That's um, an associative type of situation where it's like Pavlov's bell. Uh, we don't have control over that, but we want to change how that person feels about spiders. And it's the same thing with dogs. So you'll see how both of those concepts apply when we're working with aggression cases. Okay. One more thing before I start show going into the techniques is I use a lot of reinforcers, meaning either food, toys, play, uh, but a lot of times it's food. And a question I get is, you know, aren't you reinforcing that behavior by tossing treats at the dog while it's barking or lunging at you or trying to bite you? Uh, and the short answer is no, because what we're doing is really trying to change the dog's underlying association for that particular trigger in the environment. We want to change that from a bad situation to a good situation 
by pairing something good happening. So in the vast majority of my cases, if the dog's barking and lunging at me, if I'm tossing treats at them in a certain way, they sometimes will start to take the treats. Not all the time, but sometimes will start to take the treats. In most of those cases, if they do, I start to see a shift towards the dog being more affiliative and friendly with me because, hey, I'm the guy coming to their house tossing treats. So you don't re end up reinforcing the barking and lunging. You actually change the reason for the barking and lunging. And if the dog doesn't feel the need to bark and lunge at you, then that behavior goes away. So here's a good video example of that. Uh, let me just make sure the volume's okay. So going back to our fuel and match analogy, you can see that the match or the spark that's uh, that's eliciting that behavior is me walking towards the dog on its own, on its property. So the environment or the context that's happening, it's happening on the property behind a fence and I'm walking onto the property. So that's the antecedent. Um, and we can reasonably assume some of the fuel there is being on his own property. So we might label that fear aggression, we might label it territorial aggression, but we don't need to because I now know that the dog is barking and lunging at people when they come onto the property. That's gonna give me much more information. So now I can change the association, people coming on property, equal good things happening, and I can start to reinforce desirable alternative behavior. And you'll see also how I work where we got, we wanna avoid all of that barking and lunging in the first place by setting the dog up for success, by changing the environment for our training sessions. So um, ideally, I don't wanna see any barking and lunging at all, but, Sometimes that's not the case. Uh, so let's see the technique now. Um, first thing before we start actually training the dogs, we have to identify what we're gonna use to reinforce the desirable behaviors, the replacement behaviors. Most of the time, many of you are familiar with using food. Uh, so using treats or something the dog really likes for a food item to reinforce desirable behavior. Um, sometimes I'm using play or social uh, behavior with the dogs. Now that includes no toys. Sometimes uh, some dogs really just enjoy um, the, the physical aspect or the, um, the play style that you might have. So you might chase with them or they might chase you and you just get silly and down to the ground. So um, that can be done without toys as well. And play is also a nice counter to aggressive behavior because uh, it's very hard to be playful and having a good time and fearful or aggressive of some towards something at the same time. Uh, some dogs are more motivated by toys. So you can see, I'm sure some of you that have sport dogs or working line uh, dogs, you might see that concept where they're actually more interested in tug than the treats you have. So I might use toys in some cases. You do have to uh, ensure you're controlling the arousal level when you're working with toys and you're not overstimulating the dogs, but uh, there's a way to do that. Um, some dogs are really uh, into using their nose. So think of your beagles or your scent hounds. 
um, you might use the opportunity to sniff something to reinforce desirable behavior as well. Uh, and some of the, the nice research that's coming out now also uh, expands on the benefits of the dog being allowed to sniff and using their olfactory senses to um, uh, really just taking the environment and de-stress. So it has a impact on their stress levels. There's some great research now coming up about what types of scents can reduce the stress in dogs. So um, there's a lot of benefits to certainly allowing the dog to use their nose to reinforce desirable behavior. And last but not least, I might sometimes use distance uh, because that's what the dog wants. They want distance from the stimulus. They want to make that thing go away in most cases. So if I can give the dog the distance it wants when it displays another behavior, something desirable like looking at me or looking away from the other dog, uh, sniffing the ground, I can reinforce that behavior, say, oh, I like that. That's much better than the barking, lunging, and growling you would typically do. And we'll give you the distance because we know you see the stimulus you have. So I don't use that particular procedure quite as often as the other ones because that is more stressful to dogs. But if some dogs aren't motivated by any of the other things, and that's rare cases, but it can happen, we might use distance. So first things, the most important part of this really is identifying what reinforcers the dog that you're working with really, really goes for, because it's important to, uh, to have a nice, powerful reinforcer you can use. Because if you're, you know, it really depends on the situation too. If it's just like people, if it's scary enough or you're, if the dog's feeling scared enough of something, it doesn't matter how powerful the reinforcer is, we've, we've got to change the environment. So it's like a person falling out of an airplane with a parachute, right? So if you're falling out of an airplane with a parachute and I come by and I'm skydiving next to you with my parachute on and I have a bunch of $100 bills or a bunch of money for you and I start giving you that money as you're falling out of the plane, probably not going to be very valuable to you and you're not even going to be thinking necessarily about the money at that point. So same thing can happen for dogs. We want to make sure we're not shoving them out of a plane without a parachute. We're setting this, we want to make sure we set the environment for success, but we also want to make sure we're having powerful enough reinforcers. Okay, next thing to look at is how to change the behavior in those contexts. So um, some of the most important things to focus on when you're using positive reinforcement are these three things. The, re the threshold is the point at which the dog displays the undesirable behavior. And usually that's dictated by distance and intensity of the stimulus. So let me give you an example. Um, let's say the dog's issue is barking and lunging at other dogs on walks. So you go out of the house, the dog's on leash, try to go for a walk, sees another dog, starts to bark and lunge at the dog. The threshold is the distance at which the dog doesn't react to the other dog. And all dogs have some threshold distance. Some dogs, it might be five meters, you might need 500 meters with some dogs, but there's a distance at which the dog is not gonna react, the one I'm working with. So you might see a dog at a distance, but it hasn't gone to barking and lunging yet. So we would describe that as under threshold at that moment. Um, there's different definitions of threshold, but for the, for the sake of this discussion, we'll, we'll leave it as the point at which the dog displays undesirable behavior. So there's always that distance that you're gonna be allowed to work with. Our goal, to be successful is to work with the dog under threshold as much as possible. So as their caretakers and as their trainers, we wanna make sure we are setting the dog up for success by choosing environments in training locations that are going to be under threshold. Now, I know that's not always possible and we can talk about that as well, but threshold is very important to watch for because the more we keep nudging that dog towards the, uh, door of the airplane without their parachute, the worse it can get because it can be very stressful for the dog. Uh, next thing, when you're using food and you're looking at classical conditioning or changing associations, it's very important the order of events that happens and how you deliver that food uh, or re whatever reinforcer you're using. So what I'm, let me give you another example. Let's say you have a dog that doesn't like to have its nails trimmed and um, you go, you know, you go, the owner gets um, creative, they go to the kitchen, they get a jar of peanut butter because the dog loves peanut butter. So they bring out the peanut butter and the dog's like, oh, give me peanut butter and comes over. And then the next thing you know, the, the owner quickly clips a nail because the dog's distracted by the peanut butter. Works pretty well for that situation. Next time the dog needs its nails trimmed, owner does the same thing, goes to the kitchen, gets the peanut butter, and shows the dog the peanut butter, the dog's like, oh, okay, peanut butter again, and then that dog, the owner clips the dog's nail again. Third time, 
week later, the dog, the owner goes to the kitchen to get the peanut butter. The dog sees it and takes off running and goes in the other direction. And the reason why is because they've done it in the wrong order. Peanut butter starts to predict nail trims. And if you do that enough, you can actually make things worse. And uh, that happens a lot with, um, let's say, go back to that leash reactive dog again, the dog barking and lunging at other dogs. A lot of owners will use a treat. They'll put it up to the dog's nose to turn it away from the other dog, or they do that before the dog even sees another dog. And what can happen is the dog starts to learn that when my owner puts a treat up to my nose, that means another dog's about to show up. So what actually can happen is the treats start to predict again a bad thing happening. And that's one of the fastest ways to actually get a dog to stop taking treats on walks because they're going to say, I don't want that treat because every time I get a treat, the dog shows up in the environment. So very important that the food happens after the stimulus. So food happens after I appear on property or food happens after you see the other dog in the environment. Very, very important. Um, and last but not least, I can't stress enough the importance of finding a high value reinforcer for the dog. So that that might mean experimenting with different things. Sometimes you, I work with clients and they work, they have some treats, but they've only tried a couple different kinds and they think their dog really loves that one treat. And maybe they do love that one treat, but I guarantee you there's almost always something of higher value. And I wanna use that exclusively for when, when the dog's around its trigger. Uh, so, cause I want the dog to say that. The only time I really get this super awesome, these super great hot dog, for instance, is when other dogs are around. So let's go look for other dogs because that's the only time I get hot dogs. So by, by establishing that association, you often get much faster behavior change. Okay, last but not least, you're gonna be making sure again, we're controlling the distance from the trigger. So if I've got a dog that barks and lunges at other dogs and walks, I'm gonna pick locations where I know I can maintain that distance and gradually decrease distance with each session. Um, the intensity of the stimulus is also important to pay attention to because sometimes it's a, a completely different level of intensity. So if you look at the dogs on the right of your screen there, you can see I'm going to be able to get much closer with my dog that has issues with other dogs to this puppy versus this dog here. If I encounter those two dogs on a walk, I'm going to need much more distance from this intensity of the stimulus. Uh, same thing can be done for, let's say, the dog that doesn't like its nails trims or its ears cleaned, it snaps at the owners when anybody touches the ear. Um, it might be the distance or the intensity might be as subtle as this. So if I'm first working with the dog, I might be just doing this and then reinforcing the dog. Okay, you see my hand moving slightly towards you and then I'm going to uh, pair that with a treat. And I'm gonna move slightly. So it might be just centimeters sometimes. And of course that dog that has issues with handling, I'm not gonna do this, right? Because that would be too intense. So always, always look for how you're controlling distance and the intensity of what you're working with. And the last thing to look at there is the length of the session. Question I get is, Mike, how long do I work with my dog for? And the answer, it depends. It depends on the dog, just like people again. We have a, a limit to how long we can learn in a stressful environment. And there's always going to be some level of stress anytime his dog is working around something they previously felt threatened by. So, um, so Again, we try to set that up as best as possible for the dogs so they don't feel that much stress, but there's always a little bit of stress with learning. And some dogs are gonna only be able to handle a minute or two of that. So you might only be able to handle uh, a minute or two of learning how to skydive, or you might, some people might be able to go all day learning and having fun doing that. So with dogs, most of the times around 20 minutes of exposure to the stimulus that I'm working around. So if I've got a dog that has issues with other dogs on walks, I might do a 20 minute walk, but, the other dogs, I'm going to try to set it up where the other dog can come and go out of the picture or be in an environment where I can give the dog I'm working with a break in that 20 minute time span. So I might do two minutes of exposure to other dogs, then give that dog a one minute break while I'm going to go sniff in the grass or something. Then I might do 30 seconds exposure. Then I might give them a two minute break. Then I do, might do three minutes exposure with a one minute break. You want to, you want to randomize the trials. You don't want to do the same exact two minutes on, one minute off, two minutes on, one minute off, because dogs can tell time really well and they'll start to pick up on that pattern. So randomize it. Generally about 20 minutes, you might do 30 minutes with some dogs, 10 minutes with some dogs, one minute with some dogs, but your dog will let you know what their what level of stress they're experiencing through their own body language uh, and their behavior. Okay, so let's look at the technique I use here. Um, 
I use a I use marker training with a lot of dogs. So if you're not familiar with marker training, that's where we use a signal in the environment to say, I like what you did right there. So like it's like a flash on a camera that says, you know, when your butt hit the ground, that's the sit I was looking for. And I'm going to reinforce you after you hear that marker signal. So some of the classic ones are saying the word yes or the word good. Um, sometimes people use clickers. Those are all event markers, we call them. And just says, I like what you're doing right there. So I use that with the dogs I'm working with. And I'm going to be marking a behavior that's desirable. So instead of barking, lunging, growling, snarling, snapping, what can the dog do instead? And the remember I said the easiest thing is what we want to catch. The easiest thing for dogs to do is to just notice the stimulus. Just notice, just notice, just look at the stimulus without barking, lunging, growling, snarling, snapping. And the beauty of it is they're doing that anyways. So we're not training anything new. They're learning just to notice the stimulus and environment. I'm gonna say, I like that you did that instead of this other stuff. Uh, I'm gonna re mark and reinforce that. So I might say, yes, and then give the dog a treat. Next, the dog's gonna look again. Yes, and give the dog a treat. And I'm gonna repeat that again for the amount of trial time in that trial. So I might do one minute of doing that. Yes, feed, yes, feed, yes, feed. Every time the dog looks at that particular stimulus. What happens at the same time is the dog starts to learn that that particular stimulus is, is what's making the treats happen. So the dog's like, huh, this is not so bad after all. This guy, this new guy coming into my home with his training stuff, every time I see him or anytime he moves or does anything, at a level I can handle, so he's not doing anything too intense, that's going to predict treats for me. You can start to see the dogs really shift towards, I'm not so, uh, I'm not having such a hard time after all with this. So here in this video, you'll see a client of mine. We're much closer, this is much closer than I would typically get with a lot of cases. Sometimes I need a lot more distance, but this dog's a lot, uh, this, is, this dog's okay with a short distance. But, which is nice because I was able to get a nice camera angle uh, with this particular case. So you see the client marking the dog for just noticing me in this, uh, in this video. Good. Good. Yeah, perfect. Good. Good. So I'm doing little movements and he's noticing that. Yeah, yeah he's, he's a little skeptical of that. Good. Good. There you go. Good. Good. All right. Then we'll do a couple more and then we'll give him a break. Good. Good. Oh, you're doing good. Good. There you go. So you can see the dog is just noticing me. I'm, I'm doing things like tapping on the gate and moving a little bit. So I'm adding a little bit of intensity to it. And the dog's starting to learn that, okay, if I just look at this guy, that's going to pay off for me. Now, if you are a good, uh, if you're making good observations here, you also see the dog sitting and laying down. And guess what? The client didn't ask for any of those behaviors. The client never said sit. The client never said down. The client never said look at that guy. The client is just capturing the behaviors she likes. Now, that's the beauty of it is this dog has learned in this type of context when there's treats involved. If I sit, sometimes I'll get treats. If I lay down, sometimes I'll get treats. Most dogs do that, right? They learn, if you teach them a couple times how to sit for a treat, and you just stand there with a the treat, sometimes they'll offer that behavior. And that's exactly what we want them to do when their trigger shows up in the environment. We want them to say, here's a new guy. All I have to do is look at him and that'll pay off for me. Now, most cases as well, we're empowering the dog to really just be and act in their own environment, behave in their own environment without restrictions. So there's protected contact here. There's a baby gate. You, of course, want to be safe in these cases, but we don't put much expectations on the dog's behavior other than capturing what we like. Because with aggression, much of the time, it's the dog just wants distance. And if we ask them to sit, stay, or watch me, or ask them to do anything that's gonna restrict their ability to move away from that particular stimulus, we run the risk of removing their flight option. And if you do that, you're left with what? The fight option. So many of the cases you're gonna see, the dog might be unleashed, but they're often very given much freedom to just choose to make those behavior choices uh, and, and, the, and we can reinforce the desirable ones we want. 
Okay, so this is the same dog, same session, just a little bit later. You can see, um, again, an example of how fast the dogs start to learn that. Anytime this guy does something, it predicts food for me. So you'll start to see the dog actually look back towards the owner because now I've become the environmental cue to look back for food. Good. Good. The next one, don't say anything yet. Yeah, just feed him when he looks back at you. There. So see what's happening now? Yeah. What he's starting to see is I'm doing something and he's looking back just as if to say, look, he just made a noise or he did something. Good. So you, so you can see that now she's, the, the owner's really just capturing that looking back at her now. But if you could see the dog is learning that everything I do predicts a treat. So rather than it being a scary thing, it's now predicting good things happening. And you can see where I'm setting it up where I've got enough distance there and I'm keeping the intensity low enough where the dog's just noticing it. Because clearly if I went over there and tried to give the dog a hug or something, that would be way too intense and not enough distance. The goal is to get up to those kind of goals, points of getting close to the dog, the dog being fine in close proximity with you. Uh, but again, you take gradual steps towards that in your behavior change process. Here's a little bit more of a severe example of this. This is a dog that um, uh, the client actually told me they don't really care for people. Um, and so she, her goal was just to be able to walk in her own neighborhood. Uh, one of the issues was that she couldn't even walk the dog in her neighborhood because the distance, she couldn't get further enough across the street without the dog barking and lunging, the dog would try to bite her. The dog has actually bitten her, what's called a redirected bite while the dog's barking and lunging. So you'll, this is a little before video of the behavior. And so go back this way. Okay. Uh, so watch her, yeah. So watch her when she... Redirected? Just like this, yeah. like this, she swung her head and got me in the thigh twice. So you can see quite an intense response from that dog. Um, note on the um, uh, prong collar as well. I don't advocate for prong collars with my clients, um, but I don't also go in and say, you know, you've got to get rid of that tool right away. If the client's feeling more in control and comfortable with the handling, especially if they've been bitten or they've been pulled down to the ground, I won't change that tool right away. I will work towards changing that tool, but I'd like to build trust and rapport with the client uh, so I can have a conversation with them later on the next session or something about tool changes. But I don't want to remove something in, immediately that's going to have an impact on my relationship or trust building with the client, uh, unless of course it's being used detrimentally. So if they were like really just yanking and can't stop that, of course, I'm going to talk, address that right away. But if it's not having a immediate uh, obvious effects, then I'm going to get a little trust with that client before I ask them to change out that tool. Okay. So this is the same client, same dog. What we did was we, I asked her to practice in her driveway. Okay. So when you see people walking by, at least in your driveway, you have enough distance. So she did that for a few days and then was able to uh, get to this distance where she's now out on walks. And you can see this street is, you know, the average width street for the US here. And um, she's marking and reinforcing the dog for noticing these strangers walking towards her. Uh, now this is a video she sent me, her husband took the, the video with the cell phone. Um, and sometimes it's easier if the client just stops and works with their dog because it's a little harder to walk and reinforce at the same time. I usually find that progression a little easier. However, some dogs do better if you keep moving. So it, again, case by case basis.
So again, she's reinforcing the dog for just noticing the people going by. You can hear her marker signal is the word good. And then the food happens after that word happens. So it's that order of events. People showing up means my mom's going to say good, and then she's going to give me a treat. So the behavior of just noticing is being reinforced and the association of people showing up predicts this treat routine is going to happen. Now you can start to fade out the, the um, rate of reinforcement uh, as the dogs get better in each situation. So you can see there's a pretty high rate of reinforcement happening here. Or it's good feed, good feed, good feed. And that's, the, that's important. You do very high rate of reinforcement in the beginning if you want to see faster behavior change. Um, and that's going to allow you to start to fade out and use other reinforcers or not use quite as many reinforcers. But again, gradual progression towards those steps while decreasing distance. Okay, here's another case. Um, this is a German Shepherd named Diesel that I worked with a little before and after uh, video, but this is a dog that's not taking treats from me when I'm tossing them. And so what do you do there? You know, you go, if you're a trainer or you're working in the shelter environment and you've got a dog that's barking, lunging, and you're just, you've got to get the dog out of the kennel for whatever reason, or you're the trainer and you got to start working with the dog. What do you do if you're tossing treats and the dog's still just barking and lunging and you can't, there's, you're making no change with that. So this will give you a little idea of what to do there. So this is the before video. Hi. So let's see. Bring him, can you bring him out of the grass? Sorry about the rain. <laughs> Just bring him right about there. Okay, so you can see that I'm tossing treats, not taking it from me. It does take treats from the owner. And so we know that the antecedents, of course, is me walking onto the dog's property uh, or walking towards the dog. We can see um, some interesting body language there. We can see the dog's fairly confident about um, barking and lunging. So the tail's not tucked, the tail's up higher, and the head, ears are up. So classic kind of um, fairly confident German Shepherd behavior there. So same day, same session. Remember what I said. The variables you can change are distance and in intensity of the stimulus. So all I did was coach them. I said, okay, let's put the dog away for now. Let's talk a little bit more about what we're going to do. So I coached them on the technique and all I did was increase distance. So it's the same session, just a change in the distance. And now the owner's the one feeding the treats. Again, marking and reinforcing the dog for noticing me in the environment at a greater distance. So it doesn't start with the barking and lunging. And that's going to allow me to get closer to the dog. So it will take food from me. As soon as he notices, you're going to catch it almost like a flash on a camera. You're going to be like, yes. Yes. All right. So wait for him to notice, and you're going to catch. So until he looks at me, until he looks at me. Yes.
Okay. So um, you can see that the dog's going to be much more successful if you have that distance. And then what we did was um, I had her practice that technique with other people. So you see, you know, if you have friends that can come over and stay at a distance, we're going to start to get Diesel used to seeing people at a distance, but reinforcing desirable behavior and changing the association he has when people approach either you or your property or Diesel. And uh, so she did a great job practicing this um, over the course of about 10 days. Uh, from our initial consultation so i come back and i'm able to start getting closer to him you can see this time he is taking treats from me All right, so you can see the kind of the progression there. So your first time, he was like, no, you're not coming close. But if you, again, take that progressive step towards, let's just reinforce you for doing something else. And you're gonna learn this guy's not so bad after all, because he's got treats too. Um, you're able to decrease that distance. Um, and then of course, as you go along, you might start working with the dog more hands-on, depending on the case, and uh, uh, gradually continue to establish a relationship with that dog. All right, so here's a second session with a, um, uh, I brought another trainer with me, so you can see the process of we start at a little bit of a distance with new people uh, before we start to generalize it to all strangers. So you can see um, that in that particular video that I'm not really putting much training pressure on the dog. I'm not asking the dog to do anything particular. I'm cueing the dog to sit and down and things that it already knows. If it does sit, great. If it doesn't, I could care less. All I'm doing is just establishing a trusting relationship with the dog at that point. So the dog starts to learn they can trust me and I can trust the dog, of course. Um, and so I'm just doing some very basic training there, but I'm also really watching my body language and how I'm interacting with the dog. Um, and that's important because in order to to be successful with many of these cases the dog has to trust you the dog has to have, you have to establish a relationship where the dog says you know i can trust you so um it really depends on where you're at in the case with if you're going to handle the dog or not sometimes you don't even need to handle the dog but uh if your goal is to do that for whatever reason you are working for in that case do it in a way that the dog feels okay with it uh, not just grabbing the leash and holding on for dear life or, or trying to stop aggressive behaviors because that's going to uh, often erode your relationship with the dog. Okay. Um, this also works for uh, husbandry exercises. So um, 
again, if we have dogs that are have issues with handling, so husbandry exercise like ear cleaning, handling, uh, nail trims, uh, any kind of things like that can be, uh, you might see aggressive responses from some dogs. So the same type of concepts apply here is just reinforcing desirable behavior, but also changing the association for the dog. Uh, and again, having this conversation with the dog that says, are you okay with what I'm doing here? So this is a client, this next video is a client I work, I'm working with in, uh, she lives in Norway. Uh, so it's been all remote online consulting. And this dog has issues with a lot of stuff, but just uh, what this video shows the handling exercises we've done. It's a little before and after video. Um, one of the issues was the dog has um, issues with the muzzle and uh, resource guarding the muzzle and handling issues. So part of the first video is the one she sent me before I even started working with her to give you a little before of just how severe this case was. And, and some of the beautiful work she's doing with the husbandry exercises, same concept, changing associations. So in that video, the concept there is the dog is dictating exactly where it wants the procedure to go. So when the dog is looking at the treat bowl, that means it's saying, I'm ready to move to the next step. You can go ahead and clip my nail or do whatever you're doing as long as I'm looking at the bowl. If I look away from the ball, that's me saying, I need a moment. So um, you can look that up. It's a Chirag Patel. Chirag Patel is a great trainer from the UK. He's got what's called the bucket game. It's got a very similar concept where the dog is basically dictating if they're okay with the next steps in the husbandry exercise. Okay, so moving on here, um, and I got a, a note from the uh, tech team here that we're going to go to about 915, which is perfect. So we're going to do Q and A in just a little bit, but I'm going to go through some of the prognosis here uh, in aggression cases. And what are, what does prognosis mean? It basically is just like we can get a diagnosis from a doctor or, or a professional, basically helping you understand what the potential outcomes in your case is dependent on all the variables that are important for your case. So, cause the, no two aggression cases are created equally. They're always going to have different variables and you'll see all the different variables I assess for and, and try to determine what a potential outcome is in a particular case. Um, so the, the options, so there's options in aggression cases. The ones that uh, basically will happen in most aggression cases are gonna fall in one of these five categories. So ideally, 
with our clients, most trainers would love to see management with behavior modification happen. That means we are managing the dog, we're preventing them from biting whatever they're biting, but we're also changing the behavior. We're actively working on the behavior change, just as you saw in the last few videos. Doesn't always happen, unfortunately, based on, again, some of those variables. Sometimes it's just management alone, where you're just managing the dog and preventing the aggressive responses. An easy one, an easy fix, for instance, could be just a dog that growls near their food bowl when people approach it. Just don't go near the food bowl or feed the dog separately in an area where nobody's gonna walk by and that's a very easy management fix that might be reasonable for some cases. Uh, in some cases, we, we might be looking at rehoming the dog if that's ethically um, responsible. So rehoming is not always an option uh, because the dog might be very dangerous or the new home might not be equipped. You might not be able to find a home equipped for uh, handling that kind of dog. Um, so, but it can be done in some cases. Let's say you have a dog that has issues with cats. You move the dog to a non-cat home. Uh, those kind of things can be uh, successful. Uh, behavioral euthanasia is one outcome that can happen in some cases. And it's important to uh, discuss that, I think, as we're going through the prognosis, because there are cases where um, it is extremely dangerous or ethically irresponsible uh, to rehome that dog or to put that dog into society. And I can talk about some of the variables that we would look at that uh, would impact that particular decision. Uh, and then sometimes doing nothing and living with it. <laughs> some people will say, oh, maybe I don't have a problem. Maybe I will let the dog keep biting me uh, and it's because it's not that bad of a bite or something like that. And that can happen in some cases. Of course, that's not always fair to either the people or the dogs, but sometimes that's the outcome. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's kind of talk about what severity is. And because um, I, I get that question a lot. Some of my clients will ask me, you know, Mike, on a scale of one to 10, how bad is my dog? Or is my dog a red zone dog? Or, you know, and the answer is it, it, it's not black and white like that. There's, again, so many things to consider about what severity really means. So if I have a, let's say I have a dog that bites children, right there is, is kind of a, it raises alarm bells. Oh, you got a dog that bites children. That's not good. Um, but let's say uh, you have two, let's say you have two dogs that bite children. You have two different cases. Both of them bite children. But then you go into the one case where the dog is biting children and it sent children to the hospital um, with severe injuries, maulings. Um, and let's say they live in a home with five children and they live next to a school and a daycare. That's a severe case, right? Now, if you look at the other end of the coin, you get the other dog that bites children. That dog only bit one child in its life. And it was when that child was trying to ride that dog around the house like a pony and the dog's got spine issues and the dog turned around and snapped at the child and just uh, left a little spit on the skin. Not quite as a severe case because it's very understandable why that dog might uh, behave in that way. So um, there's a lot of var variables in what a severe case is. And it's not just the bite history. Again, going back to um, the severity of those two cases if you have a very explainable bite dog let's say got injured and got hit by a car and we're picking them up to take them to the vet uh they we happen to touch their broken uh, bone that they just uh, suffered from they might turn and bite you pretty severely normal response for a dog that's in a lot of pain and um, that might be the old dog's only bite history. So that doesn't necessarily dictate that and, and if it's a severe bite it doesn't necessarily dictate the severity of the case um, so kind of triage and look at the entire picture. I'm, I'm encouraging that anybody that's making these, these decisions, whether in the shelter environment, uh, for your own dogs, for your rescues, whatever organization or decision-making process you have, it's important to take a step back for a moment because there's a lot of emotions that can become involved. Uh, we get attached to the dogs in our care. Of course, the dogs in our rescues and, and shelter situations. Um, but to to look at it objectively, sometimes we wanna take a step back out and look at the entire case, look at all of the variables based on the information we have. Okay, uh, so really quickly, why, why do you have a prognosis? For me with clients, it's the best way for me to ensure we're setting realistic expectations and that we're on the same page. So for any of you trainers that are listening along, if we have any trainers or behavior consultants that are listening in, a good, uh, prognosis discussion with the clients 
is going to help you avoid some of the typical things we can suffer from in our industry, such as burnout, compassion fatigue. Because if that client has a lofty goal, they want their dog that just bit a child to be the next therapy dog at the library with people with you know kids reading to it, probably not a realistic goal for that particular case. So if we're on the same page with clients, we can make sure we're setting expectations correctly, but also avoiding uh, problems later on down the road. All right. Um, so I'm going to actually, because because of time constraints, this one's much more trainer centric. So I'm actually going to skip through this slide and go to the next one. So what does success look like? That's also an important thing to consider for your cases. Um, and that's very important because you want to think about what success looks like for the people involved, what success looks like for the trainer if they're getting help, and what success looks like for the dog. So what can happen in many aggression cases is that we manage things, and a lot of clients are doing this already. They, they put the dog in a crate when the people come over to the home or they put the dog in another room. So they're managing it well. Um, that might feel like success for them. Let's say they have a busy household and there's a lot, maybe they have a home business or something. There's lots of people coming and going all the time. So the dog is contained much more often. Um, or you have a shelter environment where a dog is, has bitten its people and is being contained or, or um, you know, in a sanctuary kind of way where the dog is contained to a kennel or some area and they get very little social interaction and very little exposure to the world. So we can manage these things really well, really tightly where the dog's not going to bite anybody. But you have to consider the quality of life and welfare for that dog because dogs are social animals just like people are. And we see from the human side what happens in solitary confinement, uh, just how detrimental that can be from a mental aspect. Same thing can happen for dogs if they are secluded and, and kept in a way that is avoiding the aggression, but it impacts their quality of life to the extent where it's much more suffering, I feel, for that dog in that kind of situation than behavioral euthanasia, right? Because if we can't successfully uh, change the dog's behavior or safely work with that dog, um, we might be doing worse things for that dog by saying, all right, we can manage you away, but your quality of life is going to be terrible because you have no exposure to anything enriching. So we have to be very careful about when we're assessing what success looks like, what factors do we, we look at. Um, I'm going to skip this slide too. This is a more for trainers. It kind of talks about when the prognosis happens. But let me go to this slide. These are the factors I assess in my prognosis. Um, you don't have to go furiously note taking right now. You'll have the PDF sort of slides. And I'm going to go through all of these um, uh, in this presentation. Uh, half of them today, half of them tomorrow. So, looking at the uh, most important component is the bite history. That, of course, is going to determine the severity of the bites. Um, because that matters. So if you have a dog sending people to the hospital with multiple punctures and lacerations, that's of course a much riskier case than a dog that's bitten 20 times and barely left a scratch. So I'm looking at the severity of bite because that typically will predict future bites. So if I have a dog that's bitten 20 times and left a little bit of spit on skin, we can reasonably assume the 21st bite is gonna be around the same level. Um, all things being equal, sometimes that bite level can escalate depending on the circumstances and the age of the dog and a, and a few other factors. But most of the time, you'll see the bites be around the same range. Similarly, if I have a dog that sent people to the hospital, I've got to be very careful because that third bite or fourth bite could be sending somebody to the hospital. I use a couple of different bite scales when assessing for severity. Again, I won't get into detail with those here, but there's actually scales that rate depending on the severity of the injury it rates that bite on a certain level that'll allow you to give a, gives you a little bit of information about how severe and uh, the risk is in the case. Uh, there's a couple of different bite scales. One assesses dog to human bites, which is Ian Dunbar's scale. And I use Kara Shannon's bite scale for dog to dog bites. Um, and this is also, for, again, for your trainers and anybody working with clients or adopters uh, that are listening in, sometimes the perception of bites can really skew uh, the direction the case goes because dog bites are sensational, right? They make the media a lot. You know, there's, there's as few fatalities or severe maulings there are, 
they almost always make the media. So you hear about them. So there's a lot of misconceptions about dog bites and how people feel about when a dog bites. Uh, and there's a lot more emotional aspects. Sometimes we have to put that in perspective for our clients. So I might have that child that was bitten while riding their dog like a pony and it just left a bear, bear left a scra scrape. But the client's hysterical. You know, how dare my dog bite my child? Um, you know, the, and they give you all these reasons why the dog shouldn't bite the child, but you have to explain to them, well, the dog's doing something very normal when it's in pain, um, and when something inappropriate is happening to it. And the level of injury is less than your child when they fell off the bike the other day or they, you know, slipped on the pool or, or whatever kind of injury that can happen to children all the time. So we have to sometimes put it in perspective uh, to help them understand that sometimes it's not that severe. And of course, sometimes we have to help them that it is very severe and they're not taking it very seriously. So you have different uh, perceptions that we have to help them through. Um, this is Dunbar's Bite Scale. I'm just gonna uh, scroll through these slides real quick. You can find these online, Dunbar's Bite Scale and Kara Shannon Bite Scale are both available uh, through Google searches. You can kind of get an idea of those. Uh, bite scales. Okay, so the next thing I look at after the bite history is the size, the breed, and the age of the dog. Um, certainly size, of course, is going to matter in terms of the amount of damage a dog can do. Great Dane is going to do much more damage than a Chihuahua, typically at the same bite level. Um, you also have to look at the dog's age. Uh, if I have a dog that's two years old, one and a half to two years old, that's getting towards social maturity, um, versus a dog that's six years old, uh, I'm gonna have different, um, let's say wiggle room, wiggle room on the amount of behavior change I can make happen depending on the age of the dog. Like a six month old puppy, for instance, or adolescent, I'm gonna be able to often shift the, the behavior a little bit faster or more efficiently than a six year old dog that's been biting for five years. And we do have to uh, focus on breed as well. Again, I was talking about breeds that we, as humans, have selected for certain behaviors in their routine and their work and previous to what we do with many, many dogs now is, is we want them just as companion dogs is not in any kind of working capacity but some of those behaviors are still there so i don't recommend for instance necessarily getting a livestock guardian dog for an apartment in the city uh, because you might see some of those breed characteristics pop out uh, you know so we have to be uh, aware of that when we're also assessing overall prognosis uh, if you don't believe in um uh if if you have you might have heard that saying you know it's all in how you raise them or it's it's you know it's, you know you can train the behavior out of any dog it's not true we have to consider genetics as well so show you this video group of puppies that were not trained to do this this comes out naturally We don't need to necessarily train uh, certain behaviors into dogs. We have to remember genetics play a role. Um, when I'm going through the history with the dog, I'm also asking about their social history. How much social exposure have they had to different things in the environment, um, other dogs, people, and um, what that looked like? Because we all know that, especially right now with the pandemic puppies, uh, that there's a lot of lack of socialization, lack of exposure. Uh, and what can happen is the dog starts to say, whoa, that's, that's something new. And I'm I feel threatened by it, so I'm going to use aggression to make it go away. And sometimes we'll see that with lack of socialization. So we have to keep in mind um, how much social exposure the dog has had. Next thing we look at is predictability. Um, how predictable is it for the owner? Now, when you get good at it, it's very, very predictable. But obviously, with if there's going to be different levels of handling and different abilities of the, to read the dog's body language. So if you have somebody that's completely new to dogs, trying to work or handle a dog that has a real severe history of aggression, that's not good for the overall prognosis because we often need the right handler and the right owner for that particular case. Because if not, we're gonna often see the aggression surface because the, the person is not predicting it well. All right, next up on the list is this range of antecedents. So if I have a dog that just growls near the food bowl, and it's fine everywhere else, that's a much easier case for me, less severe than a dog that is 
growling at a food bowl, doesn't like to be pet, doesn't like men, women, or children, doesn't like bikes, cars, or strollers. And it's, there's more, just so many things that trigger the aggressive response. That is more poor for prognosis because of the potential for uh, the aggression to surface. What about the intensity? Um, so this matters from uh, the client standpoint a lot because it's uh, their ability to manage it. So if they have a large dog that barks and lunges at a high level of intensity, they're going to have to have a better, often physical uh, ability to keep manage that dog, but also handling skills to manage that situation. Um, and also they can be embarrassed. So if you have a dog that's just go out on walks with and it's just barking and lunging and just creating a huge scene, that can be embarrassing for the owners and that can have an impact in the overall potential for them to continue working with the dog uh, and or do any training. So we have to keep that in mind. Manageability is how well they can manage the dog in their environment. And sometimes that can be done really well. Again, shelter situation or place where you have a lot of savvy handlers. Dogs are often managed really well, uh, or you have a single owner home versus a, a single, uh, you know, a busy family with five kids and they all have to remember to shut the doors or close the baby gate or so uh, if you have poor manageability aspects it's not usually a good prognosis in the long run because there's often going to be what's called a management failure uh, again and i can't stress enough you have to consider the welfare of the dogs we can often manage things really well but if we don't consider how that's going to impact the dog we might be doing much more damage to that dog in the long run or worse you know, there's this, if we're restricting what's called Bramble's five freedoms, that's impacting it, uh, the dog, in a um, definitely from a welfare perspective, but from an ethical perspective, as humans, we have to consider that what we're doing to these dogs could be worse fates uh, for the actual outcome. Uh, let's see how we're doing on time. So I've got a couple more slides. I think I'm almost done with this, so we should be able to get to Q&A in just a minute here. Um, training history is important for me as well when I'm looking at the dog's background. If they've had some training and foundational skills, it's going to be a little easier for me than if a dog has got no, no foundational skills or training at all. Um, it's helpful because uh, it often speeds up the behavior change process if the dog understands like marker training or sits or you know some basic things and the client also has some training skills on their own versus somebody brand new to training the dog's brand new to training uh, you often that means more client resources so more sessions more time involved more resources again whether it's your rescue or shelter or the client spending money on training and all the other stuff that needs to happen maybe it's equipment maybe it's veterinary exams so um, consider the resources as well uh, last but not least is the ability of the clients, um, their handling skills, how they learn, are they committed, um, it's important. So you all know, I'm sure you've met people that are good at training and some people that have a little less, of, they have kind of two left feet uh, for training. And certain types of aggression cases are going to require better mechanical skills from the client. And if you have a client, again, that's mismatched with their dog, you have to consider the overall outcome there. And bias is very important too to consider. What I mean by that is they might have certain beliefs about training. So they might have certain beliefs about how you treat dogs or how you train dogs. And if we're trying to dispel those and there's, and despite what we try to do to change how they might be thinking about something that could be detrimental to the to plan, that can really have a negative impact over time. So. The last video here is a good example of bias um, and what people read online and you have to sometimes deal with the information they're getting online and why they shouldn't be doing those things. So I'll play this video for you here and then we can get to Q&A.
All right, there's my contact info. Tomorrow we're going to get into the rest of the prognosis. So that was about half of the elements I talk about in the prognosis. Tomorrow we're gonna go through the rest of the prognosis and also a case study where I'm gonna show you how I worked with this dog, Leo, from start to finish using the techniques I just showed you. So we'll go to Audrey for some Q&A here. Uh, let me jump out of my screen share. Thank you so much, Mike, for the presentation. It was indeed insightful and I'm sure many of us learned a lot. We'll now proceed to the Q&A session and uh, thank you to everyone who has sent in your questions, but due to a shortage of time, I'm sorry, but we might not be able to get through to every one of them. So let's start with the first question. Um, are there any science-based methods available to reduce bite levels in a dog that has bitten before with uh, bite levels referring to the Ian Dunbar scale? That's a great, great question. Uh, nothing that's been validated at this point. Anecdotally, I've uh, talked to some uh, trainers, especially the bite sports trainers that have been able to modify levels of bites, especially, and we do it, we do it often in puppies. Um, there's still some debate about how much that actually happens with human involvement versus what they learn with their litter mates. Um, but from a from an aggressive response standpoint that's motivated by fear or underlying negative associations, so not one that's necessarily trained for fun like a bite sleeve kind of or holding onto a tug toy um, i personally feel there's not much you can modify that because it's a reflexive response in many ways there's, just, there's that element to it so um nothing nothing out there science-wise or validated at this point that i'm aware of Thank you. We'll move on to the next one. Um, can you share how you would train or reinforce a dog that is not at all food or toy motivated? So some of our Singapore specials were like our strays. They are extremely skittish and they are switched off all the time or too scared to do anything. Really good question. Um, I think, you know, and especially with street dogs, you know, there's, I've had my experience with street dogs thinking I could use food or something in there. Some of them can be very picky depending on the area because the food is so plentiful. So, you know, I, when I was in like Chile, I was trying to give like some bread to a dog and most dogs here in the U.S. be like, oh, that's great. But there they're like, I eat, I eat steak every day because it gets tossed out of the restaurant in the back. So, um, so yeah, food can be, food can be tricky, but um, oftentimes with those dogs, I might even, if I'm trying to just get close to dog, let's say it's a stray dog and I'm trying to get close, I'm going to go a lot with desensitization. So just gradual exposure to me and making sure the field dog feels safe about it. So how I approach my body language, making sure I do nothing that the dog feels is saying, mm, I don't trust this guy or, or I, you know, he's feeling threatening. Um, and then I might try to bring back in the food because typically dogs that don't take food or anything else, they're it's because they're falling out of the airplane with a parachute. Their stress level is too high. They don't feel safe about you. So I'm not going to take a $100 bill from somebody that's pointing a gun at me, you know, and it's the same thing for dogs. So I'm going to make sure that first, I'm going to try to do as much as I can to make them feel safe, um, depending on the environment, and then bring in the other reinforcers. Um, and because safety trumps everything else. So you have to make sure the dog feels safe before you uh, try to layer in those reinforcers. Thank you. Um, the next question asks, how would you recommend working on a dog with aggression towards visitors in an apartment setting where one has limited space and is unable to increase enough distance to keep the dog under threshold? Yes. So um, rule of thumb there is good handling skills. It's just the analogy I use all the time is it's just like good defensive driving skills. So somebody that drives in the suburbs of, uh, you know, with, with hardly, hardly any traffic, they're gonna be a much different driver than somebody drives in downtown Singapore, or downtown New York City. They they have to deal with much more traffic. They're much more aware of their environment. So similar to somebody living in an apartment building in the city, you have to be much more aware of what's going on because you're constantly in traffic, so to speak. So there's different techniques and handling skills you can use. Um, some of the, the ones that I use are distraction techniques where I'm using food. Now, important how you use food, remember, because if you if you start distracting the dog, consistently before they see the stimulus, you run the risk of making things worse. So distraction techniques can be used in a way that the dog either never sees the stimulus because you distract the dog so well, um, or you use it sparingly. Um, so I use food tubes a lot, which is um, rather than just giving a treat, because when I go to my treat pouch to get a treat and give the dog a treat, the time it takes me to go back to my treat pouch, they're gonna go look and look around their environment. Food tubes, which is like, um, 
I don't, I don't know what they have in Singapore, but they have like spray cheese here in a can, or they have food you can soft food you can stuff into a uh, looks like a toothpaste tube, and the dog's licking, licking, licking. So you've got their attention the whole time uh, using that food tube. Um, you can do it with your hand, what's called a Kong hand. You just stuff a bunch of treats in there, and the dog's you know again licking. So distraction techniques like that can go a long way in those tight environments. So that's just one. Um, I use a lot of visual blockers where the dog can't, I, I place the dog in a position where it can't see something coming down the hallway or um, around a street corner. I get very creative about how I do my handling skills. So, you know, let's get you to sit over here, focus on me for a minute, thing goes by and then we can start going again. Um, all the while, while you're working on the actual behavior change skills. Uh, sometimes in those cases, you might also cons uh, consult with a veterinarian or veterinary behaviorist about um, situational medication that can be used to help that dog in those environments. If the dog at a point where they're so stressed by the environment, none of the stuff we're doing is helping because they're so stressed by the environment. We often have to help them cope with that. So that's another thing. There's a lot of different um, uh, visual blocking tools. There's something called the thunder cap that can be used that uh, blocks the visual stimulus for some dogs. Uh, on like great for car rides um, or other locations where this it's very difficult to control what's happening in the environment. So that's the short answer. Uh, I, I do actually a full webinar just on that handling techniques for the for the dog in the city because it does require a good handler. Thanks, Mike. Um, the next question: How would you approach a dog that the owner has difficulty managing or has little control over? For example, in Diesel's case, what if the owner was not able to manage to control the dog or treat the dog as per your instruction? Yeah, you'll see some of that tomorrow as well, but I, I, um, I will have, I'll set up protected contact. So what that means is something to keep me safe in between the dog, uh, at least two layers if the dog has a bite history. So not just a muzzle or not just a fence. It's gotta be like muzzled dog behind a fence or dog on a leash with something else. So two layers of safety is very important. Uh, but I often will have the owner, when I'm not there, attach the dog to something very sturdy using a long line. Uh, so uh, like a 20, a 15, 20 meter line. So the dog has plenty of freedom, freedom of movement. Um, and either they're behind a fence or they're muzzled if they have a bite history. And I will, or I, I sometimes have protective gear as well. And I work with them at a distance. So now the owner is not handling the leash, but the dog is still safely contained. Uh, so they can't physically get to me. And I can still work with the dog with giving them as much freedom of movement. That, and that, by the way, that long line is attached to a, a, a rear clip harness. So you never, you never want something around the dog's neck on a, a long line like that. Uh, and that can allow you to work with the dog without the owners even being around or having to worry about handling the leash. Thanks, Mike. Okay, the next question says, um, we live on a ground floor apartment that is very open. My four-month-old puppy doesn't bark when he goes on walks, but he barks at every single person that walks past the house. We aren't always able to have a reinforcer ready each time it happens. Uh, do you have any advice on what I should do? So, the, the, uh, with all problem behaviors, it's very important to manage it, especially that one, because... It's so self-reinforcing for the dog. So if something goes by, the dog's like, bark, 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 and then, then the thing goes away and the dog's like, yes, that works. I'll remember to do that in the future. And so it just becomes very easily reinforced behavior. So it, that particular behavior does have to be managed quite well. So either containing the dog so it can't get access to that view or blocking that view somehow. Uh, for many of my clients, I use window film. It's like that opaque film you can just apply to a window so they can't see out. Still lets the light in. Um, it doesn't block the sunlight, but it still it prevents them from seeing those people going by. So something like that. Uh, during the time you're working with them, you can um, often expose the dog to that environment, but as long as you're in training mode, uh, and then you, again, restrict their access with the goal of eventually they have free access to those things. If your training's consistent, it's got to be very consistent because that's such a self-reinforcing behavior. It's also a very normal behavior for many dogs to bark at things going by. So sometimes I set expectations, okay, we're going to let your dog bark, but let's let it bark once or twice and then come check in with you. So it's not this bark, 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 bark for forever at the window, stressing everybody out, including itself. Uh, let's teach your dog, let me know somebody's there. Thank you. Come over here and now check in for a treat. So you create a behavior chain. Uh, if your training's good enough and you're consistent enough, 
you can create environmental cues, behavior chains, where the dog sees something out the window, bark, bark, comes and checks in with you without you doing anything, because the dog's learned that chain of, I see something, let me go tell mom or dad, and I will get reinforced for that. So, uh, but it's important to remember to be consistent about that. So really depends on the situation, uh, how you would modify what you do there. Uh, maybe just two more questions. Uh, the next yeah, one. Yeah, and I can go. I can go a little longer, Audrey, too, if you want. I can. I have a hard stop at quarter of, but you know, if we want to get okay. a few more questions, I don't mind. Yep. So the next one is on uh, the Dunbar scale. Um, mm -hmm. The question is whether the recommendations for each bite level by Ian Dunbar are actually a good guide for the prognosis of the dog. Great question. And the reason why is I am currently on a team of professionals working on a new bite scale with the blessing of Ian. Ian actually joined one of our meetings says, yeah, if you want to have go out and to, to modify the scale, because the issue with Dunbar's scale right now is that the difference between level three and level four bites uh, is very, uh, it's a, there's a stark contrast. So level four biters he labels as risky and are, are somewhat dangerous. Level three biters are often workable and not as risky, according to the language on the scale. The, the issue is, is that the difference between a level three and level four bite is the depth of the canine tooth. So that it punctures the skin. And I don't know how many people you know that have been bitten are going in and measuring how deep that canine tooth went into it. So it's actually very difficult to uh say for sure the difference between a level three and a level four bite so part of the scale that we were in development of is is assessing many other factors not just that so yes we're looking at the 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 level of injury but it's not so much where you have to be a medical professional to say oh that's a level three a level four um because that's not the only thing you're going to look at you're going to look at bite style so if it's a bite and hold and shake you're going to look at what the uh, victim was doing you're going to look at just how much effort the dog put into accessing the victim so a little bit like the prognosis we've been going through uh, but the, i think the bite scale should not be taken as the sole decider of the outcome of a dog you know with the exception of the extreme so if a dog's killed people level six biter um obviously that's uh, there's there's some considerations that need to be made uh, uh realistically there and ethically and legally in some cases uh but um so there's limitations on dunbar scale so my my take-home message is don't rely on just the scale make sure you look at all of the other variables that we've been talking about before you, you assess for severity Thank you. The last question is, um, is it possible to create positive associations without visual exposure to the trigger? So, for example, if the dog is extremely uh, reactive, uh, for example, just the scent of a strange dog can trigger the dog. Yep, absolutely. That's a that's another great question. Um, yes, absolutely. It's re really whatever stimulus in the environment is predictive of that particular trigger. So it can be the smell, it can be the sound, it can be the sight. Um, you know, and it's super interesting too, the, the, all the, the scent part of things and just how much, you know, as we know how powerful the dog's noses are, just how much of an association that has. And what we really don't know about the dogs, I think enough of yet, you know, we know a lot about the dog's scent and their power of it, but we don't know how much the dog's communicating used through use of pheromones. We know they communicate and get information from each other when they're sniffing each other's rear end and things like that. But the scent can be such a powerful thing to to look at. I mean, if you look at some of the other creatures, you know, I learned in Costa Rica about just how much ants communicate with pheromones exclusively. So they can't see, they're blind, but they, they know how to communicate through the entire colony with just pheromones. It's, you know, really fascinating. And um, we can argue that dogs also are, are getting lots of information from pheromones. So we might be, you might be, they might be communicating in some ways that we don't even realize about when they smell another dog. So that dog's pee, for instance, says, you know, don't come near here. And this is also my home. This is where I live. And this is what I ate yesterday. And all of those things the dogs might be getting from a communication standpoint could be happening. So, uh, but anyways, the, the answer is yes, you can, you can pair. Uh, and, and you sometimes have to do that with dogs that are blind or deaf. You might have to um, look at getting creative with how you create positive associations. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, I think we can continue the Q&As tomorrow. Uh, so for now, thank you to everyone who have submitted your questions. And we've come to the end of part one of our webinar on the science of animal behavior.
We hope that you've managed to gain some useful perspective on canine aggression and how you can modify their behavior safely and effectively. Head over to our Facebook page, Animal Bus SG, for more educational information on animal ethology and like the page for regular content. We hope that you would join in for part two of the series, same time tomorrow at 8 p.m., where Mike will continue sharing on dog aggression case studies. If you did not manage to catch today's session, you may also view it on uh, Facebook, uh, NPARC's YouTube page, or scanning and saving uh, the QR code below. Thank you very much, Mike, and for everyone who has joined us today. Uh, have a very good night.